mention this morning, um, a whole bunch of economists got together and wrote an open letter <coughs> on immigration. So I just wanted to start out by reading that. This is from 2017, so um, who it was specifically addressed to is a little bit dated. Um, Dear Mr. President, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, Speaker Ryan, and Minority Leader Pelosi. The underside economists represent a broad swath of political and economic views. Among us are Republicans and Democrats alike. Some of us favor free markets, while others have championed for a larger role for government and the economy. But on some issues, there is near universal agreement. One such issue concerns the broad economic benefits the immigrants to this country bring. As Congress and the administration prepare to revisit our immigration laws, we have right to express our broad consensus that immigration is one of America's significant <coughs> competitive advantages in the global economy. With the proper and necessary safeguards in place, immigration represents an opportunity rather than a threat to our economy and to American workers. We view the benefits of immigration as myriad. Immigration brings entrepreneurs who start new businesses that hire American workers. Immigration brings young workers who help offset the large-scale retirement of baby boomers. Immigration brings diverse skill sets that keep our workforce flexible, help companies grow, and increase the productivity of American workers. Immigrants are far more likely to work in innovative, job-creating fields such as science, technology, engineering, and math that create life-improving products and drive economic growth. Immigration undoubtedly has economic costs as well, particularly for Americans in certain industries and Americans with lower levels of educational attainment. But the benefits that immigration brings to society far outweigh their costs and smart immigration policy could better maximize the benefits of immigration while reducing the costs. We urge Congress to modernize our immigration system in a way that maximizes the opportunity immigration can bring and reaffirms in continuing the rich history of welcoming immigrants to the United States. Sincerely, 1,470 economists. <laughs> I'm not one of them. So I wanted to get into a little bit more detail um, about the things that they're talking about in that letter. Um, and Megan did a really good job uh, covering this this morning. But the first thing to talk about is who is the, the immigrant population? So as of 2017, the US foreign born population reached a record of 44.4 million people in uh, the United States, which accounts for about 13.6% of the US population, which is getting close to the record high back in the late 1800s of 14.8%. And this may look familiar. Um, I can also use this. Um, and then who are who makes up the immigrant population, as Megan said earlier, um, there are about 35.2 million authorized immigrants and 10.5 million unauthorized immigrants. Uh, the vast majority, uh, the largest group of immigrants are already naturalized citizens, um, and about 23% are unauthorized or undocumented immigrants. So immigrants in the workforce. Immigrants in the U.S. make about uh, about 17% of the total workforce, and as you may remember from the last slide, um, they account for about 13.6% of the population, so they uh, are in the workforce at a higher rate than um, native foreign workers. They participate at a higher rate. Uh, and the immigrants are projected to drive the future growth of our of the U.S. economy um, and the working age population until about the year 2035. And um, something that was mentioned by the economists in the letter is the baby boom generation that is now um, largely entering into retirement age. And immigrants and their children are expected to offset that decline in the working age population by adding about 18 million people of working age between 2015 and 2035. 
Uh, and this is particularly important because the U.S. birth rate is not at um, replacement level, meaning which I think is 2.1 children per, per, per family. Yeah to replace and keep our population the same. Without immigrants coming into the US, our population would be declining. Um, and we wouldn't be able to replace workers that are leaving the workforce, which would not be good for the economy. So, um, as many people have probably heard at some point, the uh, myth that immigrants are, are taking jobs away. Um, there is broad agreement among academic economists that in the long run, immigration has a small but positive impact on the labor market um, for native born workers. So long run, it's good for native workers to have immigrants coming into the country. Also in the long run, immigrants do not reduce native employment rates, um, but evidence suggests that in the short run, that there may be a very, very small negative impact on immigrants coming in, but that's only because the economy doesn't just adjust immediately. There has to be time for it to work out, but in the long run, it is a positive to have immigrants coming in. And also, there is no evidence that immigration pushes wages down. Uh, research has found immigration has only extremely modest effects on wages for native born workers, including those with low levels of education, um, who are typically thought to be competing most often with uh, especially undocumented immigrants. Um, the truth is that the people affected most by new immigrants coming into the U.S. and entering the workforce are older immigrants because they're competing for the same jobs in a lot a lot of times because they're moving to the same areas and they're also having a lot of the same skill sets so they're competing with the generations of immigrants who came before them and not necessarily with native foreign american workers um, yeah small and mostly positive the regulations on immigration and workers coming in through certain visa programs that can have um, a downward pressure on wages. Um, so there are guest worker programs um, where workers and employers can give visas for people to come into the country uh, to work seasonal jobs. This is very common in agriculture and other industries as well. But with these visas, the immigrants coming in are tied to a very specific company. They can work for that employer alone. Um, they have no option to go find other work. Um, if something comes up, if there is harassment or other problems on the job, they can either go back home or they can stay. And for a lot of the people involved in this program, they have put a lot on the line. They've left their family to go do this to make more money in the United States to be able to bring home to their family. So they don't have a lot of bargaining power. Um, and the regulations also state that um, where the wages have to be set. There's a prevailing wage is the term that's used um, that they have to be paid. Um, and unfortunately, this is often lower than the market rate. So this is more downward pressure on wages, but it's legislative. <clears throat> so, um, immigrants contribute a lot to the economy and have accounted for uh, about two thirds of our economic growth since 2011. They have founded, they're very, very entrepreneurial on average, and have founded 30% of US firms including more than 50% of startups valued over $1 billion, which is huge. That's a huge number. And if anybody's wondering, that's Elon Musk, one of the people with a billion, over, well over a billion dollar startup, I'm sure. He's originally from South Africa, and he has South African, Canadian, and US citizenship. I know he's controversial, but he's a good example. 
So I also want to talk about unauthorized immigrants and their fiscal impact, because when you hear the rhetoric about how they're a burden on society, these are often times the people that they're referring to. It's the people that didn't <coughs> come here with a visa or they overstayed and don't have a work permit. But like the general immigrant population, there's broad consensus that they have a small but positive uh, impact on the fiscal budget of government at all levels, when you look at all levels and buy. In the long run, there's a very large um, impact at the federal level, and it, because it's the federal level, it's just spread out across the entire country. Um, however, when you look at the state and local level levels, there is a, a bit of a, a negative impact. Um, you have to think about what, what are they getting at the local levels. That's where you see uh, undocumented children in schools and um, going to the hospital, that sort of thing. But when looking at all the impact combined, it's still positive. <coughs> And going off of this, um, they're not positive for public benefits because they contribute a lot more than what they take out. Um, immigrants pay taxes. I don't know if you guys I know work a lot with immigrants as well, but I rarely come across a client that hasn't filed their federal taxes um, and state taxes. Immigrants pay sales tax when they go grocery shopping or buy anything at the store. They pay property taxes because they're living somewhere, they're paying it in their rent or if they own a house, they're paying their property taxes. And they're paying um, their taxes um, through their payroll and income taxes when they file in April with the rest of us. Um, and the Social Security Administration estimates that about 75% of unauthorized immigrants, so undocumented immigrants, are actually on formal payroll. So that means uh, that Social Security is being taken out of their paycheck um, and going in to the Social, Social Security Administration accounts. But unauthorized immigrants will never be able to claim those back. They're never going to qualify for Social Security benefits. Um, so in 2005, it was estimated that unauthorized immigrants pay about seven billion per year in social security taxes that they'll never be able to reclaim. However, I just want to point out um, that if somebody does get status and they do give social security number a valid one, there is a few years that they can go back and um, amend their taxes to claim those social security benefits so they can get their quarters, which I'll mention a little bit later. I don't know how many, is it three years, five years, something like that, but they can go back. Okay. So yeah, they could maybe get a few years back um, only if they are able to get a lawful status. Um, and public benefits, this has been so big in the news um, about immigrants, using public benefits, everybody's on welfare, and that's simply not true. Um, unauthorized immigrants, including those with DACA, um, aren't eligible for almost any public benefits. Um, they can't get food stamps, SNAP, Medicaid, um, SSI, um, TANF. They don't qualify, they can't get these things. Um, however, they are eligible for, in a couple rare circumstances, they can get emergency medical treatment. Um, and they also qualify from WIC. Um, you know, it's probably going to be a, a U.S. citizen child being born, so maybe we should take care of them. I don't know. Um, but <laughs> or just because they're a person. Um, all right. And then, uh, this was mentioned earlier as well. Uh, even once somebody gets uh, their residency, they probably don't qualify for benefits right away. There is a five-year waiting period before they can qualify for most um, federal pu public benefits. Um, <coughs> however, there are ways that you can get around the five-year bar, and one of that is by having 40 quarters of work. That's 40 quarters of Social Security. You can earn up to four in a year based on your income. Social Security releases how much you have to earn to qualify for a quarter every year. 
And with quarters, you can also count your spouse's quarters towards your own, or if you are under 18 and your parent was working lawfully and accumulating quarters, you can count theirs as well. It gets very complicated. Um, and then also like with what was mentioned earlier, so depending on your category, so if you're an asylee or a refugee, um, and then some uh, victims of crime, so maybe if that was used, uh, depending on where they are and if, as far as state benefits, um, and they might qualify for some federal benefits as well. Um, asylees and refugees qualify once they come to the United States or once they get their asylum granted for public benefits. However, um, they have to stay on track um, to get into citizenship in order to maintain their eligibility. So that can be a real problem for some, some people. The risk of losing benefits. Excuse me, how do they monitor their own track? There is a timeline. Um, how, and Nancy knows better than I do, how many, before someone loses their benefits, how long do they have to years. Okay, yeah. So once they've been in the United States for seven years, they need to get their citizenship or they risk losing benefits. Is, it, is, is that not just for SSI? That's just, yeah, that, that's the specifics for SSI. And then the other form of benefits we can have in the state. But if you're not eligible for SSI, do they monitor and track your, how do they, do they monitor or track you on road to citizenship or not? No, you yeah. have to establish your immigration status to get those benefits in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so they know what category of immigrant you came as. Right. And then um, after you get it for a certain time, they start denying your benefits, your SSI, saying that you know, you've run out of your seven years maximum allowable. Mm -hmm. So they do track how long you had it. Right, but if you're not on SSI. That's not an issue. Then it's not an issue. Depending on what state, some states yeah. you max out on benefits. Mm -hmm. So, Cynthia, I just had a refugee who's been here for eight years and her food stamps just got cut. And she's not on SSI? No. So, how do they monitor? I mean, I, they, I, I don't. But she so so really well. But they don't know if they're on a track for citizenship. So. No, you, think, you don't have to be on the track for citizenship. You have to get the citizenship. So they're going to send you a letter saying we're denying your benefits because you've maxed out your seven years. Then you have to send in your citizenship. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought the seven I years know. was for SSI and otherwise. But I know what Nancy has told me is that they watch SSI more closely. Oh, like well, SSI is very fast. Like that's the first, you get, yeah. it's the first thing. If you get close, you get close to that seven years, you will get, you know, I don't know, how, I don't know exactly how many months out, but you will get that. Yeah. Your benefits are going to cease on this day and on this day. And, and Claire, that's not a, just a general W-2 TANF rule, that specific, I mean, maybe they, they got kicked off because they don't have any more minor children in the house, or they're I, I don't know the, the specifics, I just wanted to, she, she was concerned because her food share just got cut and she's been here. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to kick into this, because I wasn't aware that our non-SSI refugees were, had a timeline. I, I can send you. I did a whole thing for disability rights and public benefits and immigration status. Yeah. But I can send these. So I, I got to find it, but I'll send you a reminder. Oh, yeah. That's what I mean. That's for disability. Yeah. And I'm speaking non disability. There's a 24 year old mother who's a refugee who's on public benefits. No, I'm sorry. I was not talking about disability. I did it for a place called disability rights, but it's all public benefits. There we go. You know, she's got a four-month-old baby, and she's 24, and she doesn't have any disability issues, and she's on uh, whatever it's called these days, W-2, I guess. I wasn't aware that unless the, the general, anybody who's not, who's a native-born, it's a time limit that refugees had to become uh, citizens or be on track or whatever. Huh? I have to look it up every time. I'll send you a reminder. It'll send you cross out in about 10 seconds. By the time it's some of it's federal funded through the states, some of it's the states, and some of it's straight to feds. Mm. And everybody made their own mismatch rules. But I'll look for that thing and I'll send it to you because it's got SNAP and food stamps and W2. Thank you. All yeah. that kind of stuff. The part
makes it so quick. It's like you, the minute you get your green card, you're a qualified alien, but you don't qualify for anything. So even the vocabulary is so counterintuitive. You read it, you just kind of start like making up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're referring to victims of certain crimes, is it specifically recipients of VAWA, Yuvisa, Chivisa, or just does it apply for other victims of crime? What is it referring to specifically? I was referring specifically to VAWA, UT, and I believe that varies a lot state to state. Because um, I know on like the approval letters, they'll say, like, you can use this to help me qualify for benefits. I, I don't know the specifics on that. Okay. You used to get food stamps in the state of Wisconsin until Governor Robert came in, and now you don't get food stamps in the state of Wisconsin anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you guys were mentioning, uh, I think it's the Masai, or do you come in with an or do you have a asylum status and you do not become a citizen within those seven years? Do you also lose your asylum status? You don't lose your asylum status. Um, and by that time, you should be a, a, a resident, too. Um, because after one year of your asylum status, you can apply for your residency. Oh. Yeah. But they won't just think about it. Could you repeat the questions this we're not hearing? Oh, sure. Yeah, she was asking about whether um, if you don't get your citizenship, if you'll lose your asylum status.
Then about 50% of the population live in the poverty line and SNAP benefits, depending on the state, are on a sliding scale. So you can be anywhere up to a certain percentage, like 130% of the federal poverty rate and still receive a small SNAP benefit, like about $8 a month. Oh, yes. So it is almost a third of the U.S. population receiving yeah, I mean, that, that number has gone down. You have to remember we're recovering from a recession still right. at that, that point. So it was much, right. it'll be lower now. Uh, All right, I also want to talk about specifically Wisconsin and the impact that immigrants have here. Um, in 2015, immigrants made up about 4.8% of the state's population. And over 55,000 U.S. citizens in Wisconsin live with at least one member of their family who is undocumented. And like we saw with the federal numbers, um, immigrants uh, have a higher rate of participation in the labor force and account for 5.9% of the Wisconsin labor force as of 2015. Uh, and something that I thought was really important to think about given that we are the dairy state, that nearly a quarter of all workers on Wisconsin dairy farms are unauthorized immigrants. All right. So specific to Wisconsin the contributions, immigrant-led households in the state paid $1.4 billion in federal taxes <coughs> and $675.4 million in state and local taxes in 2014. <coughs> Undocumented immigrants paid an estimated $71.8 million in state and local taxes. And DACA recipients alone paid an estimated $17.8 million in state and local taxes in 2016. They're paying a lot of taxes. That's what I say. It's taxation without representation. So on average, um, I want to talk specifically about dairy farming, and I'll get around to why I want to focus on this in a little bit. So on average, dairy farmers started hiring immigrant labor around the year 2000, um, and many Wisconsin dairy farms now have to hire um, employees outside their family for a few reasons. Um, they're increased herd size because they have to compete with factory farming more now. It's harder to have a smaller farm. Um, they have tighter budgets, and so a lot of times family members are going to seek work outside the farm, outside the household, to really set a base level income that they don't have to worry about a bad year or anything, um, and to also get health insurance. People are also having less, fewer children, and like I mentioned, spouses, children are willing to not work on the farm. It turns out it's very hard work, and you have to get up really early. And I don't know, I don't want to do that. <coughs> so. They don't have markets so. now. So, um, and UW did a, a survey, and one farmer reported not being able to hire an American worker for a, a U.S. native born American worker since 1997. Um, they, they don't, they're being forced to hire um, immigrant labor because Americans aren't applying for these jobs. Um, one stated, um, we cannot find the American person to come in and work full time on a dairy. It's too many long hours, it's too hard of work, and it's seven days a week, 365 on a dairy farm. A cow does not take a day off. Um, and another issue beyond just the family not being able to work on the, the farm, even finding people in the community is getting harder because there is being there is a shift to moving to larger urban areas and not as many people living in rural America anymore, rural Wisconsin. Even though Wisconsin population grew to six percent between 2000 and 2010, a quarter of our 72 counties actually saw their populations shrinking. And most of those counties were rural, where you find the dairy farms. So um, it's been said that uh, politics can make strange bedfellows. 
Um, and so at Catholic Charities, we're all members of AIDLA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And I 